Amazing. I would like to introduce a very special uh, person, a great friend of mine, and of all the Lauren Hardy fans the world over, Mr. Randy Scribbett. Another <laughs> person shares, Probably the one with the microphone. Yeah. Thank you. We do intros, they're late, but they're good. <laughs> Russ will be working in another tent very soon. So. Actually, I'm a man of radio more than those other things. That's and correct. Even, even though we're in San Diego out of our broadcast range, they can pick up my show on the computer. I do a show every Sunday. In fact, I'll be, through the miracle of automation, I'll be on the air tomorrow, even though I'll be here physically. I do a show called Forward into the Past at Pomona College. I've been doing it for almost 34 years now, every Sunday from 2 to 5 and I play records from the 1920s, 30s, and early 40s, and in the middle hour of three, I play old-time radio shows, so I try to get the whole uh, audible world of entertainment of that period covered. But if you like music of that period, from vintage 78s, well, you can hear it on the internet at www.kspc, as in kspace.org, and it's every Sunday from two to five, so I'll be there. And it's an excellent show. Thank you. Not that I have to say that, but it is. <laughs> We, we can all close our eyes and pretend we're listening to the radio. <laughs> you, you could do that, just don't fall asleep. He did that. Well, wake up for the tonight. movies. <laughs> so uh, we want to ask Randy a few questions about sure. the book. Sure. Uh, besides being a great weapon against spiders. <laughs> um, and a book stop and uh, barbells. So now, it's very heavy. It's seven, almost seven pounds. You can now, 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 how many years have you put into this version of your book? Which well, I, I figure when you add on the er, from the earlier version, I have research material in this, uh, which I still use, that I acquired when I was 14. And uh, I'm 57 now, so I figure I have 43 years worth of research in it. Because, in fact, if you get the if you get the here, you'll get a CD, a bonus CD, which is a little extra that we give you if you buy it in person. And uh, there is a, uh, a, an excerpt from a tape that I recorded in 1974 at a Way Out West banquet of George Marshall, who directed some of the Laurel Hardy films. You get to hear him talking about directing Toad in the Hole. Well, uh, the reason we have that is because I brought my little reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. <laughs> uh, the, the Way Out West tent in Los Angeles, I was able to join that tent when I was 12 back in August of 1971. Uh, they have a, the, 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 the mama hen who runs that tent is Lori Jones McCaffrey. And she's run it for all these years. She's still running it, basically. We were supposed to be 16 to get in, because in those days, Way Out West really followed the constitution of the club. Have you ever read the constitution of the Sons of the Desert? It's cocktails followed by introductory meeting and cocktails, followed by business meeting and cocktails, followed by cocktails, followed by break for cocktails, followed by movie and cocktails, then some cocktails, and then the second movie, and then cocktails. Well. The L.A. chapter back in 1971 really followed that to the letter. <laughs> and it was more like a gentleman's drinking club. There were almost, it was almost exclusively male in those days. Older men, and they had lots of drinks, and then a Laurel and Hardy movie would come on, and then they'd all dash for the exits. So the, the emphasis was not on Laurel and Hardy in those days, but it very quickly became more and more Laurel and Hardy oriented. But the great thing about the Sons of the Desert, that the way out west end of those days was, Every meeting, there were lots of people coming to the meetings who had worked with Laurel and Hardy every day at the Howard Studios because they were at that point late 60s, early 70s. Some of them were already in their 90s, but you know they were still vibrant people and they you know, had memories of working with Stan and Babe. And I thought, how come we're not interviewing these people? Why are we watching Hogwild for the 47th time? We all know Hogwild, we love it, but you know we should have these people up on stage talking. So out of frustration, I began bringing a tape recorder and doing impromptu interviews before the meeting would get going. And a few years later, when I got my driver's license, then I started really doing interviews because I wanted to get these people's stories on tape before they died, you know? And uh, so I supplemented the ones that I knew from the LA tent with just going into the library and just going to the LA area phone books and trying to find names. That's how I found Bert Jordan, who's the accredited film editor on a lot of Laurel and Hardy films. I wasn't smart enough to know about film editors, guilds, or associations, or anything like that. I just went to the phone books and said, see if there's a Burt Jordan somewhere. And in that case, I found five Burt Jordans in the LA area, five different ones. I wrote to all of them with self-addressed stamped envelopes. This is back in early 1980, when I was 21. And all five of them wrote back to me, and four of them said, I'm not the Burt Jordan you're looking for, but good luck. And the fifth one said, yes, indeed, I am the Burt Jordan you seek. I am 92 years old, and I am hard of hearing, but I would still be delighted to have you come and talk with me. And so I, 
called and he made a reservation, went up and saw him. And he was very frail, but he wasn't hard of hearing at all. He was sharp as a tack mentally and gave me the whole story of the editing process of making the films, how he worked with Stan Laurel and who had the right of final cut and all this great stuff, which wasn't in any books, you know? So, but it's in this book. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> so finally, after getting all these, I, ultimately, I interviewed 65 people who worked with Laurel and Hardy. And I have hours and hours and hours of tapes, which I'm still trying to get into digital form from the original reel-to-reel -reel or cassettes. Uh, and uh, I finally said, well, I really need to put this into a book form. And then I started finding scripts at the Hollywood 80 convention. If any of you were at the 1980 convention, there was a guy in the dealer's room who had scripts, Laurel Hardy scripts, and we didn't even know they had scripts but he had them for sale. And so I said to a bunch of my friends, let's each buy one and we'll make copies for each other. And so we did that as much as we could. And then I talked to the guy who had them and I said, I really need to see these for a research project. He said, well, I don't want you to copy them, but you can come to my store. I'm only open on Saturday afternoons, but you can come to my store in Hollywood. So for like eight weekends, eight Saturdays, I drove from Boyda Park all the way up to Hollywood every Saturday and sat on plastic milk crates dictating these scripts into my little tape recorder as fast as I could, because I only had about four hours every day to do it. But the thing is, the scripts all have scenes that were planned for the movies that never got into the final movies. Mm -hmm. Hal Roach always said, 50% of what's in the script will not play. In other words, when you actually act it out in front of the cameras, you find out it wasn't as funny as it seemed when you were writing it. And so that's why we always had gag men there on the set to su suggest other material to replace what wasn't working in the script. So, you know, I got all of that material. And then I went to the, uh, uh, the Motion Picture Academy Library in Beverly Hills and went through all the trade papers, Variety, Hollywood Reporter, Film Daily, Hollywood Film Graph, none of which have indexes. You just have to go page by page hoping to find some Laurel and Hardy information. So went through all of those, that took like three summer vacations. <laughs> now, of course, it's all on the internet and it's all easily retrievable. I can go to the LA Times morgue the, you know, the, the LA Times, all the old articles just typed in Laurel and Hardy, and 3,000 articles show up, and there they are. But, you know, 30 years ago, I had to actually drive out to downtown LA and go to the physical <laughs> LA Times morgue and hope that they would have more than a dozen articles and clippings, which is about all they had. So, anyway, a lot of research back then, and 10 years ago, I realized that the information superhighway gave us all manner of new stuff that needed to be in the book, so I said, I gotta rewrite this thing, so. Uh, now I've rewritten it, and thanks to the internet and a whole network of Laurel Hardy fans who are uh, on the net, I have a thousand photographs instead of the 200 that we had originally, and uh, the book is now 632 pages instead of 494, and uh, it's just grown a lot. <laughs> yeah, great. You're on a beautiful tone. That's my story, and I'm stuck with it. He is stuck with it, but he doesn't want to be stuck with the book, so make sure. Oh, well. <laughs> But, yeah, we're, uh, we're only doing 2,000 of these, and about 1,000 of them are gone at this point. So, yeah, yeah. There will be a paperback eventually, uh, and but uh, that will be like sometime in the middle of next year that will start happening. Well, but the, the deluxe, the the deluxe one, version yeah, is this yeah, one. Yeah. So. And you can get this online, but it does not come with the cool CD that has the interviews with no. the uh, Hal Roach people. So. Yeah, this, this is a, a CD. It runs about 75 minutes. and. Uh, it has interview segments that I taped years ago with uh, Billy Bletcher, who worked with Babe in Jacksonville, Florida in 1916 at the Vim Comedies. Uh, Joe Rock, who produced Stan Laurel's silent movies, uh, solo movies in 1924, 25. Hal Roach himself, I got to interview him. Uh, Anita Garvin, George Marshall, who was the director. Roy Seawright, who did special effects. He actually worked at the studio from 1919 through 1945 or thereabouts. Uh, Venice Lloyd, who was Art Lloyd's widow, he was the cameraman on most of the Laurel Hardy pictures. I got to talk to both of the Laurel Hardy film editors, Richard Currier and Bert Jordan, and uh, Walter Wolfgang, Babe's widow, Lucille Hardy Price, and you get to hear the wonderful Marvin Hatley, uh, who wrote a lot of the background music for the films. He used to come to meetings and he would play piano, and he had a drum contraption under his feet, and he would play trumpet with his right hand. You probably remember seeing <laughs> yeah, this. He, did that He's, he actually show. sounded like three people playing. <laughs> and you will get to hear him sing and play Honolulu Baby, which he wrote for Sons of the Desert, and Will You Be My Lovey Dovey, which he did for Way Out West. And it sounds like three people playing, but I guarantee you it's just, just one very talented man. So just an invaluable resource, of course, and this is the kind of thing historically we have to have. Well, so. I didn't want that history to vanish. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I've spent the greater part of my life putting this yes. together. Because I, yeah. I wanted to be around uh, as long as as long as the films are around and thank goodness there's all this great restoration work happening right now at UCLA yeah. and also with Jeff Joseph 
uh, doing both film and uh, uh, digital restorations. Yeah, and we'll be showing some of those restorations very, very soon. Those are spectacular. So, yeah. they, you, you never realize how many spots and speckles and scratches there are in the original films until they're gone. Yeah. And you see how clean everything looks and you just go, oh, oh it's like looking through a window. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Jeff Joseph also had a 35 millimeter kinescope of This Is Your Life, Laurel and Hardy, which we'll be showing next season. It is phenomenal. It's like looking through a window, but black and white. It's just stunning. You can see the sweat on Stan's uh, forehead <laughs> where he's going, why am I here? <laughs> but uh, anyway, so drop by, say hi to Randy. If you can, pick up a book. We'll get the first half of our program started. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Very, very Randy much for having me here. Thank yes. you. Yes. We're look, looking forward to that March Brothers book. That's next. Right? Thank you. Yep, the Three Stooges is next, I think. That's what it is. All right, first.